Welcome everybody to this week's mini seminars in the working group on the multi-scale modeling and viral pandemics. Uh, today we've got two mini seminars scheduled uh, and possibly a little bit of discussion time afterwards on a few items of business. I remind you that the meeting is being live streamed on YouTube and that recordings will be made publicly available. Uh, so please remember that. Um, we have, uh, as usual, myself, uh, Reinhard Lavenbacher, the co-lead uh, on the working group, uh, web administration by Jim Sluka, who's on the call, and uh, Bruce Shapiro, whom all of you know well from uh, your uh, communications. Uh, as usual, I'll remind you we have a Slack channel. You're invited to use it. Um, we do need people to, uh, to bootstrap it if it's going to be helpful. If you have any issues getting onto it, uh, contact us and we'll do our best to help you out. There's also uh, the IMAG MSM Wiki page. We'd love to have you post your material, update it and uh, help people uh, make it an interesting website. Uh, I was going to change the order of the slides a little bit today, just to remind you for our upcoming meetings and mini seminars uh, on the 28th, uh, we have two teams uh, from France and Luxembourg uh, talking about uh, uh, cooperative modeling uh, related to COVID-19 infection. Uh, they've done some very interesting uh, crowdsourcing and uh, collaborative modeling development. Uh, and then on February 4th, we have Morgan Craig talking about uh, uh, modeling of immunological responses and Greg Forrest uh, talking about viral transport. As usual, uh, please suggest potential speakers that you'd be interested in. Please volunteer if you'd like to speak uh, and help us keep this uh, lively and interesting set of seminars. With that, I don't want to take any more of our speaker's time. We're going to begin with uh, a typo on your name. I'm sorry, uh, no, uh, typo uh, not, nor okay. Uh, seminar uh, by Kevin Jaynes, a Department of Biomedical Engineering, University of Virginia, Complete Kinetic Modeling of an RNA Pathogen. And uh, I'll turn it back to you for the screen share. Can I get a confirmation that everything looks okay? Okay, I see you nodding. All right, thanks very much for the introduction and the opportunity to speak in front of this working group. Um, I only have 15 minutes, and so we'll get right down to it. Overall, my laboratory is interested in gaining a systems level understanding for how mammalian cells respond to complex perturbations. And the reason why is that we think it's fertile ground for iterating between experimental manipulations and measurements computational models and analytical data mining. A lot of the work that my lab does relates to cancer, where we are interested in gaining a sense of how cells adapt to that first handful of mutations or chromosomal changes during pre-malignancy. However, over the past five or 10 years, we've become equally enthusiastic about adopting a similar perspective for host cell responses during viral infection. And if we're gonna fully embrace such an approach that iteration between measurements, mining, modeling, manipulation, I'd like to make the case for enteroviruses as a general test bed and for the enterovirus coxsackievirus B3 as a leading test case. I think it was Einstein that said, everything should be made as simple as possible, but no simpler. And in the viral world, enteroviruses are as, uh, about as simple as they come. They encode a single-stranded RNA genome that yields one translated polypeptide. And what that means is each translation event will yield exactly one copy of each of the mature proteins shown here in blue, green, and red. And that's an important stoichiometric constraint for modeling. Moreover, we have a, a quite a good understanding of what all these mature proteins do for the viral life cycle, meaning that we can organize and abstract them in an authentic way. 
Third advantage is that enteroviruses have decades of quantitative enzymology, genetics, and biophysics available. That information is scattered all over the literature, but it's there to, to mine. I highlight this remarkable paper uh, that titled the absolute number of infectious enteroviruses released from single cells, so a single cell assay uh, nearly 60 years old. And last, enteroviruses cause human disease. And while some enteroviruses such as poliovirus has been called a research field with a rich past, but no future because it's nearly eradicated from the globe, these other strains listed are still active and infect people uh, across the globe. The biggest void we saw in enterovirus research was the scarcity of cell scale models. There were a few instances of uh, models for evolutionary dynamics, but nothing related to the viral life cycle itself. And because the genetic architecture of enteroviruses is so simple, because there are 70 plus years of knowledge to build upon, and because these viruses act quickly, we sought to attempt something audacious, and that was to build a kinetic model that was complete from two standpoints. First, in covering the, the temporal arc of infection from very start to the end, and then two, uh, complete from the standpoint of the stoichiome stoichiometry of components needed for the infection to take place. And that relates to that single stranded genome and the single translated polypeptide. So what it's showing schematically here is the modular architecture of the model that we built. And I wanna walk you through the, the design and the life cycle of enteroviruses as it's currently understood. All right, so step one here is that the virus docks on membrane receptors is internalized and in this positive strand RNA virus, a vi uh, RNA genome is delivered into the cytoplasm. The delivered positive strand RNA is used as a template for translation using ribosomes from the host cell. And this single polyprotein is autocatalytically cleaved into mature protein subunits with direct roles in the life cycle. Down here, we have an RNA dependent RNA polymerase that synthesizes negative strand complementary to the positive strand, and then uses this negative strand as template to make many copies of the positive strand for more translation and eventual virion formation. The enteroviral proteinases 2A and 3C are required for polyprotein cleavage and maturation. And they also help steal more ribosomes from the cell by cleaving host cell targets. And then the structural capsid proteins instantaneously get together. They form one fifth of a self-assembled pentamer and 12 of those join around a viral RNA to form the mature encapsidated virion. At the center of it all, are a set of host cell feedbacks that give rise to an interesting systems level problem. Viral replication requires double strand intermediates during this replication step here that are uh, sensed and um, give, uh, give rise to the induction of hundreds of so-called interferon stimulated genes, which shut down the life cycle at the points indicated here, here, and here. The pathway for these ISGs is itself damaged by viral proteinases, creating a kinetic competition between the microbe and its host. Overall, the design of this uh, model uh, was to, had an architecture that we designed to be modular, recognizing that while delivery up here is very specific to each enterovirus, the intracellular core, all the downstream processes is shared by all. Um, and what, this, uh, what we hope this would do is open up opportunities to repurpose this Coxsackievirus B3 model for other enteroviruses down, um, down the road. Uh, I wanna give you some highlights of the model refinement and then transition to the central message of this work. Uh, the first thing that we learned in trying to construct this model was the importance of bookkeeping. One complication of trying to uh, build a model, quantitative virologic model, is that not every virion released by a cell is infectious uh, as defined by the ability of that vir uh, virion to kill a field of susceptible host cells, so-called plaque forming uh, unit. And the ratio of viral particles to infectious PFUs is large and more bedevilingly for enteroviruses is highly variable even within the same strain of virus with some representative particle to PFU ratios on the right. Specifically poliovirus 
um, is as close as can be to CDB3, but uh, from a genetic standpoint, but with such an enormous range of ratios here, uh, it was virtually impossible to put the experiments that we were um, doing and trying to reconcile with the model and put them on the same scale as the computational simulations. Uh, but what we did during some intense mining of our own experimental data in the thick of COVID quarantine, uh, we got a ratio estimate for our uh, preparations of Coxsackie virus B3. And we were then able to reconcile our quantitative data of the dynamics of positive strand RNA genomes, negative strand RNA genomes, and those structural capsid proteins with the model simulation. To orient you for the rest of the talk, what I'm going to show are model results uh, here in blue, or there may be other colors in the slides, is the median plus or minus a 90% interval um, defined by 100 different simulations using parameters randomly, randomly sampled about a coefficient of variation, 5% of all the parameters, that best estimate that we drew from either the literature uh, or from the biology. And then overall, this model that we constructed, it's about 55 ordinary differential equations, roughly the same number of parameters. And of those parameters, about 90 plus percent are constrained, not fitted, uh, fixed, either from the literature values or from our own experiments that we collected in the lab. One of the things that we needed to come to terms with though with this model is that even though it, it was very detailed in many respects, there were some parameters that were, uh, were and forever would be unknowable. And those mostly revolved around these interferon uh, stimulated genes and their connectivity in, in the middle here. So let's pull the veil off of uh, this part of the cartoon. As I said, this model is built from differential equations and the way that we define this edge here is a maximum conceivable rate of interferon stimulated gene synthesis that we then elaborate with two terms. The first abstracts a nine step biochemical mechanism into a sigmoidal input output equation with two free parameters. Uh, what I'll note here is that this double strand RNA concentration is something we take directly from the model uh, stimulations. And then we have a second term here that encodes the negative feedback, that antagonism by the viral proteinases. We also take the concentration of those proteinases directly from the model, but the potency of those proteinases and the, 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 the lumping of their substrates is something that we will never fully know in vivo. And all of that is really embedded in this EC50 effective concentration for how much negative feedback you get as a result of how much proteinases are in cells at the time. But even with this uncertainty, we did have some uh, important qualitative constraints based upon experiments. And so there are a couple of scenarios that we needed these uh, lumped parameters to conform to, to align with the biology. First was that if there was no double, R double strand RNA sensing in, in the model, should allow the infection to, to take off and proceed unabated. Here what I'm showing model outputs now of the virions, released virions, plus a rough estimate of the number of PFUs, um, plaque forming units, according to that ratio that I described from before. If we put in double strand RNA sensing alone, the endogenously triggered interferon stimulated response is sufficient to stop the in infection. But because that pathway is ordinarily damaged by those uh, viral proteinases, the infection proceeds with kinetics that are only slightly delayed when antagonism, um, only slightly delayed from when antagonism is in place. However, we can also run this, the, the model to receive interferons exogenously. This would be akin to paracrine stimulation from infected neighbors or immune cells. And we took this in the model as going straight to maximum synthesis in the model. Now that's done right at the time, sort of artificially right at the time when the virion docks on the plasma membrane, infection is completely averted. However, if we wait too long to add that interferon stimulus, the warning comes too late, the negative feedback is already engaged and the infection proceeds as if they had never received that interferon stimulus. So together these qualitative constraints turned out to be strict criteria for the range of acceptable values for model parameters, these lumped parameters that were phenomenological. Now on this, Last slide and this one here, I discussed how the model was, if you will, wrong in some respects, but I didn't talk about whether it was useful or not, which was in the title. Um, and so let's apply the model and see what we can, we can find. 
And the way that we did this was by sweeping through all of those phenomenological parameters, really tackling them head on, iterating through hundreds of different parameter uh, combinations, about four or 5,000 different model simulations with or without neighboring interferon stimulation added to the simulations at different time points post-infection. And in doing so, we found something interesting and non-obvious when we changed the susceptibility of the double-strand RNA pathway to damage by viral proteinases. And to remind, that was that EC50 value in the negative feedback that I described one slide ago. If we just altered the model to render the cells mildly more resistant, we saw this anticipated mild decrease in uh, virions release, kind of turning down that negative feedback. However, when we ran the same stimulations with interferons uh, signaling from neighbors, the behavior changed depending upon the time at which the interferon was added. At early times, there was a, a dampening of both responses shown here in four hours and a, a convergence, if you will, of the, the difference between the standing model and this resistant model. But as the interferon was added in a more time delayed manner, we saw a more sustained responsiveness to the paracrine interferon only in the resistant case, whereas the base model had returned uh, close to the um, situation in which they had never added interferon before. And so this was on the border of something that we could test experimentally, but to be able to do that, we needed to dive into this nine member pathway and identify precisely where the vital proteinases might be targeting and how. And so uh, long story short, using clues from the literature, we converged upon the mitochondrial antiviral signaling protein MAVs, which is uh, reported to be targeted by the 3C proteinase and teroviral proteinase. And we found that MAVs was indeed cleaved as a 35 kilodalton product uh, here in this ho our host cells when they were infected with CDB3. But we needed to do better uh, because the only way to make the pathway resistant was to know the exact site on MAVs that was cleaved. And here we turn to mining uh, through bioinformatics. MAVS is a very interesting um, uh, protein. Uh, it is, um, it was, uh, who was that? Her Hermit Malik's group showed that the, the gene is rapidly evolving and in primates and its sequence may reflect past exposure to ancient viruses. And if one looks at the, the MAV sequence in primates globally, there's a splice site variant that adds six amino acids to the protein sequence in hominoids and old world monkeys here on the top. It's absent from new world monkeys on the bottom. And in that sequence is a strong match for the peptide motif that enteroviral 3C proteinases like to cut. And this was uh, reconstructed by my, my lab manager during the, during the quarantine. Importantly, chimpanzees, us, and even African green monkeys here in, in, in green show evidence of Coxsackie viral infections in the literature. But new world monkeys, such as the marmoset, are confirmed negative even, even when those marmosets are maintained in captivity. And so um, from here, the experimental path to testing this model prediction was pretty clear. We wanted to target this candidate cleavage uh, site and then uh, evaluate its effect on infectivity. And that's what we did. We engineered cells to contain a doxycycline inducible flag tagged MAVs with or without that position 271, that splice site addition, mutated from a glutamine, which is absolutely required for the proteinase activity to an alanine, which would destroy the site for 3C proteins. We made the inducible expression pretty strong to dilute out the impact of endogenous MAVs. We confirmed that CBB3 induced cleavage is significantly reduced when in the alanine mutant compared to the glutamine, although the overall effect is incomplete because of the residual cleavage of, an, of endogenous MAVs. And we showed that the difference in cleavage coincided with the difference in viral plaques and infectious virions released after infection with CBB3. Now for the test. We infected these cells with CBB3, stimulated them with recombinant interferon added into the dish at several times post-infection. And what we found uh, was that at early times in that four to five hour window, like I showed in the simulations before here, both lines showed reduced infectivity, but at later times, the effective interferon was lost in the wild type uh, case, whereas the resistant line remained less infections. And so collectively, we think that the, the so-called wrong parts of the model were useful in uncovering 
this nonlinearity, this interaction between the timing of paracrine interferon and the resistance of host cells to an enteroviral antagonism. These findings got us more interested in MAVS regulation and the history of the various synonyms that it go, goes by. Um, this figure on the left is structurally accurate, but it's somewhat complicated. So I'm just gonna break down the acronym suit into sensors, transducers, and effectors. Um, and uh, what, what occurs here is that you have double strand RNA forming filaments on the mitochondrial surface. They go on and um, uh, poly polymerize MAS, which is normally mitochondrial localized here through these domains that bind to the double strand RNA. And it's that oligomerization of MAVs that gives rise to signaling downstream in the induction of interferon stimulated uh, genes. There are many different groups that have cloned MAVs. Um, and there are some discrepancies about where those MAVs versions that people use came from. And the most popular one, which was the one that we started with, um, is not the reference protein sequence for MAVs. This was discovered by my research scientists uh, in the lab. And um, the, the difference here, uh, to be specific, relates to a glutamine in position 93, highlighted here, um, whereas the reference Pro, human proteum has a glutamine. And so I want, what I want to orient you here is that it, this, this is the flag tag construct that we used for the experiments before. This is the self-assembly domain that eventually links to double strand RNA. This is the mitochondrial domain of the protein that enables the clustering on the cell surface. And this is that 271 position from before that um, when cut separates signaling from localization. And then this 93 position is the one I'm talking about before. So this variant here early on, we ignored because the changes in a thousand is, is registered in a thousand genomes, and it was a common polymorphic variant in the human population. The glutamate allele, the E allele, which was the one that we were working with, was rarer overall, and rather rare of those that with in African descent, for, for example. Uh, but it was just as prevalent as glutamine in those of East Asian descent. And so we thought that this was just a natural uh, variant. Yet the glutamine is the um, sequence that's widely conserved in mammals. And its presence creates a second potential cleavage site for 3C proteinase. Again, you're getting one of these requisite glutamines in the consensus sequence. That would also separate assembly from localization, just as that prior 271 site would. And so just to uh, uh, finish up here, we wanted to try to test this using the exact same things that I talked about before. We make the mutant, stick it into the cells. Compared to the wild type, we show increased cleavage at the position um, when we change to the glutamine. Uh, and then the next step was impact this overall effect on infect infectivity. But before showing the result, I want to explain what we thought that the result might be. Um, we put in a glutamine substitution. Now we have two cleavage sites on MAVs. We thought that by being twice as likely to be cleaved, the glutamine allele will be less potent as an antiviral signaling molecule compared to the original MAVs because it'd be twice as cuttable. But wrong, and, and not only wrong, interesting wrong because this glutamine allele was even more potent than the MAVs that we started with. And uh, even more uh, confusingly, it also reduced cleavage on the other site, the one that we were reading out is this 35 kilodalton product. And so here we needed to pivot kind of like in over our heads needed a, a different abstraction that would focus specifically on, on the behavior of MAVs. And unlike this complete kinetic model that I described before, this model was focused only on connections and feedbacks within MAV regulation and less concerned with the specific parameter values that like I dwelled upon with that complete kinetic model. So we built this state model in which MAVs is synthesized or um, activated, it doesn't matter in this state model, and assumed to self-assemble rapidly on the mitochondrial uh, membrane. The filament size here based on the literature is large. They form these 600 to 800 MERS. And that assembly was assumed to be instantaneous, very fast because they, it's on a membrane surface. And it's those MAVs filaments, those aggregates that um, they're degraded by an autophagic route, but they also lead to signaling through the production of ISGs that themselves are, um, have a degradation rate in this state model. And so when there's no cleavage in this uh, simple simulation, MAVs and the polymerized MAVs reach steady state values, you can solve just like you would in differential equations class. 
However, when we incorporate the steady state production of a 3C proteinase, like during an active infection, and one cleavage event corresponding to that original MAVs that I started off with, there's an, an additional route to MAVs elimination from the system, and then the production of interference-stimulated genes is not sustained. We include negative feedbacks here to, for completeness, but it turned out in the model they were not critical for the properties I'm describing here. Interestingly, when there were two separate routes to MAVs degradation, as with that polymorphism that I was describing before, we see different behavior with now sustained interferon-stimulated genes, uh, as shown in, in the brown uh, here. And that flat uh, brown polymavs trace here on the right isn't a steady state, but it's a slowly decaying exponential when the amount of monomeric MAVs here gets small relative to filamentous MAVs. And that starts to get small and decayed away. You usually get a first order decay rate with this time constant. And as I said, N, N is 600 to 800, which really drops down the rate of decay. And that polymorphism reaches this decay regime four times as fast because of those two routes to degradation. So this alpha parameter here that dictates how many times you can get cleave. Going one to two hits the peak here of MAVS polymerization twice as fast and then troughs twice as fast, meaning overall four times faster to reach to the state and then that longer decay. So what it converged toward here is that the current understanding of MAVS in this very simplified model is sufficient to explain the counterintuitive behavior of its variants. And so just to finish up, I want to touch on one implication for this for enteroviral disease, that human variation in MAVs may have an important for infectious disease because recall that that single cleavage variant has a prevalence about 50% in the East Asian population. What that implies is that 25% of East Asians are homozygous for the more virally susceptible single cleavage variant. And East Asia also struggles with enter endemic enteroviral disease which outbreaks every three years or so. And that peak incident occurs among children two or three of age. And so I'm attempting to speculate that these cycles might relate to building up enough, building up enough virus naive homozygous individuals in the population to foster community spread. And so I'll close by acknowledging the students who assisted with the work that I showed. You see it was a multi-generational effort. And then I'll point you to the bioarchive preprint uh, of this work. And then if you're interested to learn more about my group or my department, I leave these websites up for you. Thanks, and I'd be happy to take any questions. That was beautiful work. I, I, I think we better move on to our second talk. And then if there's time, have questions for both talks at the end. Sure. Because I, I apologize, but we have to accommodate two speakers. Understood. Uh, and uh, I want to make sure that everybody has time. I'm sure there will be questions and there'll be plenty of opportunity to, to answer questions uh, offline as well. So I'd like to move on.